So um, welcome back to everybody. So we resume where we left on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, we discussed um, medical accelerator for uh, retinocry production for uh, one of the two major uses, that is the production of artificial radionuclides for uh, essentially nuclear medicine. Uh, and there we saw the workhorse, which is the um, uh, cyclotron. Uh, today we go into radiation therapy and we will see the few types of accelerators which are used for radiation therapy, either you know, you know, therapy with electrons and photons or with uh, charged particles, heavy charged particles. So as you might uh, know, the whole point of radiation therapy is to deliver a tumor a sufficient dose to kill it or uh, inactivate it while um, preserving the uh, um, healthy tissue uh, around the tumor. So, in fact, the point is you have the a tumor inside the body, so you have a target volume, and you want to deliver radiation from different directions in order to build up a dose which is high enough to destroy the tumor while keeping the dose to the healthy tissue which are encountered normally before the tumor and after the tumor, so the entry dose and the exit dose, below uh, tolerable levels. And for this, you need a treatment planning. You need essentially a computer program, and now it's done no longer by hand but by computers, in which you input the uh, dose constraints, so how much dose you want to give to the tumor and what is the maximum dose you are allowed to give to the healthy tissues around the tumor, and the program will tell you which direction you have to come in with the radiation beam and which intensity. Now, the uh, again, radiation therapy started many, many years ago, and so the early machines that were used are no longer used. So, well, essentially, as I mentioned last week, they started with the discovery of X-rays <clears throat> with you know photons, and then with the uh, discovery of the neutrons, and the, the the discovery that the neutron could be produced by accelerated protons into a, a, a cyclotron. And, um, and but but the hospital machines, in fact, came much later. So first of all, radiation therapy is much more than radiation source. It's much more than just accelerator. I just mentioned that we need a treatment planning system, but essentially you need diagnostic equipment like a CT scanner to identify the tumor volume because you have to know what you have to irradiate. You need a treatment planning software to uh, be able to tell the accelerator from which direction to shoot the beam and at which intensity. You need patient setup devices. You need, you know, a couch where the patient can be aligned um, around which the machine can rotate to direct the beam from the direction you decide to deliver the beam. Um, you need um, patient-specific um, um, tools like, you know, collimators or you know, retention systems. We'll see that maybe later on in the particle therapy, so you need computers, I mean, calculation no longer made by, by hand. And then last but not least, very important, you, you need a broad range of professional figures. You need a radiation oncologist, you need a medical physicist, you need um, uh, radiology technicians, you need nurses, so it is a complex system um, delivering those to a patient for treating cancer. Now here in the picture, you see two of the early uh, tools. Um, one is the Betathron, which is no longer used. These are, there was one in use actually at the, um, at the Tumor in Milan, where I actually started studying you know, medical physics. And this is actually a Cobalt 60 unit, which is still in use in many countries, in I would say in, uh, in the third world, mostly in Africa, maybe in uh, South America, in Europe, and in, you know, in the United States, uh, in Canada, Australia, we no longer use um, uh, cobalt 60 units because essentially, um, with respect to an accelerator, while the cobalt 60 deliver um, photons of 1.3 MeV, which is way less penetrating than uh, you know, uh, photons produced by uh, an electron linear, accelerating electron from 6 MeV to 25 MeV. 
So the photon beam produced by ionic is much more penetrating. And the other advantage of the of a particle accelerator with respect to a cobalt 60 source, although it takes more space with respect to a cobalt 60, which just fits into this small uh, kind of shielded um, uh, head, is that this is always on. So, I mean, uh, um, the source is always active and you must be sure that, I mean, the, the collimator is closed when you do not need the source, but as in a particle accelerator, you turn the machines off and there's no more radiation. So um, the Betatron is uh, one of the early um, um, uh, type of accelerator. I just give you a very brief overview how was different in principle. It was a relatively simple machine because essentially what you had, you had a um, displaced. You have a, a, a donut shape vacuum chamber. This is the you know you look into the mid plane of the of the of the machine embedded into a magnet. A magnet in which the magnetic field was variable, could vary with time. And the old trick was that the, uh, <clears throat> the average flux density of the magnetic field through the orbit, here, yeah, for the, the, the particle actually coming out of the plane of the slide and back into the plane of the slide layer and just circulating onto this uh, closed orbit. Um, and the field of the orbit, there was a simple relationship between the two, which is this one. And the whole point was to that the magnetic field was produced by pulse coils, so the magnetic field was not uh, constant like in a cyclotron we saw in Tudor, so it was actually varying with time. And since the um, electron beam circulating into, into this uh, uh, vacuum chamber is an electric current, a, a magnetic field flux change in wind time would actually accelerate the uh, the electron circulating into uh, the vacuum chamber. So the increase in flux would generate an azimuthal electric field which accelerates the electron in the chamber. So the beauty of this machine was that you, you, you did not need a uh, accelerated system. You did not need, need a, a radio frequency system like in a cyclotron because everything was done by the magnet itself. It was a relatively bulky machine, it was very heavy. I mean, you've seen in this uh, photo, the uh, no, this was uh, weight several tons. And typically they were going up to 40 or 50 med, which is actually not really needed because now most of the modern uh, radiation therapy Linux, they accelerate electron to energies between six med. Some of the machine are six and maybe fixed. We will see some example later on and up to 25 MeV, but in fact, Practically most of the treatments are done with the electron between six and 18 MeV. Um, another machine that was uh, actually in operation when I started to work in this field, a few years after I graduated, it was installed at the hospital of Brescia, which is about 90 kilometers from Milan where I studied, was the microtron. The microtron, if you like, um, could be interpreted as an um, as a electron cyclotron. You remember I told you uh, two days ago, I mean, on Tuesday, that this cyclotron is a machine for protons. The operating principle of the, you know, the isotonal cyclotron is that you accelerate essentially particles that are either non-relativistic or they become weakly relativistic, and you adjust the either the magnetic field by shaping the poles, or you could change the RF frequency. I didn't describe the operating principle or of a synchro cyclotron. Again, maybe later on we can have a dedicated lecture on accelerators. Um, so that in fact, uh, you could accelerate heavy charged particles. The microtron, if you like, is sort of the equivalent for electrons. So again, you had a magnet. So you are looking at the cutaway view. So it was actually made of a magnet. Actually, I don't have a photo of this. I have to find one. So you have a magnet. Inside the magnet, you have a vacuum chamber. You have one uh, RF accelerating cavity here. So you have a uniform magnetic field. So again, as in the cyclotron, the magnetic field is, is uniform, is, is, is constant, is homogeneous. And the trick is then when you accelerate the electrons, the more energy you give, well, the less uh, uh, um, effective is the magnetic field in 
bending the radius. Remember the magnetic rigidity of the particle, the B rho, which is a, 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 an indication of the, um, uh, of the capability of a certain magnetic field to bend the trajectory of a, of a particle. So if you, if you have a fixed magnetic field and you have electrons which are more and more energetic, while well, the electron will go into larger orbits. So there will, there will be less bent magnetic fields. So while you accelerate them through the accelerating cavity, they will jump onto bigger orbits. They will keep paralyzing like this. The basic formula are the same that we've seen uh, two days ago. You know, the, the link, the bending radius of a particle, I'll let you look at those uh, offline. Uh, gamma is the relativistic factor because at the point is that the electron becomes relativistic very soon. Now, an electron has a mass, a rest mass energy of 511 kV. So, an electron of 10 kV, MeV is already uh, strongly relativistic. So, in fact, the isochronism would be guaranteed only for a very, very um, uh, slow electrons. So, if the electrons are relativistic, so the gamma, the total mass over the rest mass is larger than one. The uh, time increase, the delta tau, the time increase uh, is per turn is proportional to the increase in the gamma. So in fact, to guarantee isochronism, you have to make sure that the electrons, while they are accelerated, they come back after the complete the orbit to the excited cavities, essentially, uh, in phase with the radio frequency. So in fact, to guarantee isochronism, this uh, delta tau, so the time increase to, to, for the electron to complete the next orbit, must be um, proportional to the, um, the, the, the time of the, uh, of the RF frequency. So that again, you, you give a kick, they, they get a further acceleration, they are more energetic, they jump on a larger orbit, because the magnetic field is, is as effective to build them. And at the end, you reach, well, actually it's paralyzed this way, you reach the maximum energy and you extract the beam. And this machine typically works up to a few tens of MeV. There is a version which is called race track, where you have, in fact, the magnet, which is split in two, and you, you couple the two half of the magnet, which would actually bend the, the electron by 180 degrees, that's the 360 by here. You put in between uh, uh, actually a LINAC and uh, an uh, 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 accelerating section that can actually be uh, a LINAC. And this would allow, again, the principle is the same. They're accelerated, they are bent on larger orbits while they increase energy and they come back always in phase. And with this, you can reach energy of a few hundred, a um, couple of hundred MeV. Now, this machine, in fact, was used in radiation therapy but essentially now has been replaced by electron linux. So now the workforce for radiation therapy, at least in Europe, say US, um, um, Canada, Australia, developed countries in Africa, they're way less, is the, is the electron linux. So the linux, it's a very small machine. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the linux sits inside the treatment head. I mean, so you have a cutaway view. So the linux is maybe a meter long or two meters long, which sits inside the, this uh, uh, isostrenthic unit that can rotate 360 degrees around the couch to be able to irradiate the patient from uh, any direction. And by rotating the couch in the horizontal plane, you can also guarantee um, multiple angles. Um, so you have a LENA which is uh, accepting electrons. The electrons in the head, they do a 360 bend, and then they are pointed toward the, the patient. Now, we have two types of treatment. You can either use the electron beam directly, and as I said, the typical medical Linux have an energy between 6 or 25 MeV. Some of them are fixed energy, 6 MeV sharp. We will see an example when we I show a slide on tomotherapy. So it can be just a 6 MeV fixed. Or you can have, for instance, an 18 MeV LENAC that would deliver beams with energy in between 6 and 18 MeV. Or most frequently, because now I'm in mean, direct treatment with electrons is less and less frequently used, you insert in the beam path what is called a Bremsstahl target. It's a typical tungsten target, a heavy uh, Z target. 
which maximizes, once the electron hit the target, the conversion of the electron energy into uh, electromagnetic radiation, Bremsstrahlung radiation. With this, I think we mentioned that last week at the, when we had the, um, the, uh, the other talk on, uh, on uh, the other lecture on uh, uh, radiation protection. So what you do, you produce a photon beam and a, a, a gamma, well, a, Simply speaking, it's not gamma, it is X-rays because it is produced by atomic processes, not by the, the excitation of a nucleus. So um, we call it gamma because it's high energy. So if you have, for instance, a 10 MeV electron, it will produce a white spectrum of photons with energy up to 10 MeV. The spectrum then, I mean, the, the photon then uh, crosses some filters that would harden the, the beam, so they will remove the lower energy in order to have a more penetrating beam. At the advantage, even if you start with six MeV electron, that you have a, um, a photon beam, which has an energy, which is much higher than 1.3 MeV of uh, cobalt 60 uh, sources. That is, is more penetrating into tissue. So a cobalt 60 um, photon would, will deposit most of his, of his energy just below the skin. And actually, before cobalt 60, CZ137 was used. Now I think it's no longer used even in, uh, you know, in, in the, the poorer country because CZ137 has a photon energy of 660 kV. So essentially, most of those was given to the skin. So you really had to, you know, irradiate the, the tumor from many, many different directions to be able to reduce the dose to the skin, which would cause a radiation burn. Um, in order to concentrate those to the tumor. So now with the, with the modern Linux, in fact, the advantage is you can actually tune the reactor energy to reach the best depth of penetration. And so, of course, the higher is the reactor energy, the more penetrating is the um, resulting uh, X-ray or sorry, photon beam. After these filters, you have collimators. And in the modern Linux, uh, you know, in, in old models, the collimator were simply uh, two jaws that would uh, shape the beam either as a, you know, would collimate the beam in a square or rectangular shape. But now all the modern Linux are equipped with what are called multi-leaf collimators, which are actually a set of uh, very thick, you know, a meter thick um, ion slabs, which can be adjusted by the accelerator control system um, uh, by, um, and actually fed by the treatment, treatment planning, so the shape of the aperture can be conformed to the uh, tumor profile from that specific direction of the radiation. So you can actually shape the size of your photon beam, you know, the, 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 the blade of the collimator will cut, because it's very thick, as I said, it, make it can be a, a meter thick, and will cut all the uh, photons uh, outside the, the aperture that, 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 that you need. So this is a, a, a photo of a multi leaf collimator. So you can actually shape your beam to the desired profile according to the uh, profile of the tumor, the cross-section of the tumor from that specific direction. Because remember, a tumor is not a, a nice uh, spherical uh, volume. It's a very regular. It could, it could have very different shapes uh, uh, depending from which uh, um, direction you're looking at. So a multi leaf collimator can be adjusted. So you rotate against it, you adjust the multi leaf collimator to the profile of the tumor from that direction, you shoot the beam, then you rotate the, the, um, the LINAC, you readjust the multi leaf collimator to a different shape according to the tumor profile from that direction. We will see an example later on in a small animation. So the LINAX, as the name says, are linear accelerators. So with respect to the cytotron and the microtron that we saw, the beam is no longer uh, traveling inside the magnetic field, so it's no longer going through a circular path, but it's actually accelerating along a linear path, which has, if you like, the advantage that you do not need the magnet, but it has a disadvantage that you need several accelerating structures because the linear crosses the accelerating structure the setting gap only once because it travels on a straight line. So you need still a radio frequency system with several electrodes, one after the other, which has to be, and the say the the the, the frequency of the electric field, which uh, you know provide a, 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 an excessive voltage 
at these gaps has to be in phase with the particle velocity. So you have an electron entering the accelerated gap. He must see a negative field behind him. He must see a positive field behind him. So that is actually accelerated while crossing this gap. While it is in this region where it feels no electric field, the radio frequency has to revert the voltage so that the electron will still see a negative field behind and a, and a positive in front. Otherwise, if you get there, it will be decelerated. So the old trick is that this, this radio frequency field is actually in phase with the uh, propagation of the, of the electron. So again, Linux exists for protons, and for electrons. For electrons, once the electrons are relativistic, their velocity is nearly constant, so the radio frequency um, can be constant. If you want to accelerate protons, then you will have to adjust either the frequency of the RF field or the length of these electrodes to the increasing velocity of the protons. But for the medical Linux, and as I said, 10 MeV is already ultra relativistic, the structure is, is simple. So the, the old trick is to keep synchronization between the uh, frequency of the RF and the frequency of the passage of the particle through the gap. So this is just, just a blown up view of what I mentioned before. So you have the LENAC on the side, you have the electron beam coming into the treatment head. This is a heavily shielded um, head because you have to shield the uh, stray radiation from uh, the electrons. Um, if electrons do not exceed 10 MeV, you only have to shield um, gammas, essentially. So the gammas produced when the electron hit the Brenstein on target. When they hit the Brenstein on target, they are preferentially emitted forward, but they are also emitted isotropically. There is a component always that goes a bit everywhere. So the head must shield all the stray radiation. If you have electron beams exceeding 10 MeV, you also produce neutrons. So that in fact, um, a radiation protection of a medical Linux depends whether your Linux uh, exceeds 10 MeV or not, because you might or might not have production of stray neutrons. So the designing, the design of the, of the Linux itself, the, the, the shielding of the, of, of, of the bunker, and all the radiation protection associated depends on the energy. If you stay below 10 MeV, you don't have to care about neutrons. If you need to go above 10 MeV, well, then you need to care about neutrons. So again, Katevi can check if there is a sufficient number of people who are interested in this. We can have a one or two hour lecture dedicated to that. I know that there is one of you who is interested. I gave him some information, but we can have a dedicated lecture on this. So then, as I said, you have... Uh, you have uh, filters, you have collimators, you also, you also have ionization chambers because you need to monitor the dose. The most important thing when you treat patient is that you are not shooting a beam onto a piece of metal to do a physical experiment. You are actually delivering radiation to a human being to cure cancer. So you need a very, very accurate dose monitoring system. You typically have two ion chambers, to, to have a redundant system that would monitor the dose delivered to the patient. So what you do, you program the dose you want to give to the patient. Typically, it is around two gray per uh, fraction, per treatment. And you need to, the system, the entire system, your ion chambers must be carefully calibrated because the typical dose uncertainty in radiation therapy is 2.5%. It's very, very small. You can allow yourself to under dosage or under overdoses the patient by 2.5% fraction. So you cannot just give, you know, 20% more than what was planned. So you need a treatment planning system that will tell you exactly what dose you want to give to the tumor to this specific direction. You need a, a linear control system that would uh, keep the beam stable at that specific dose rate. And you need ion chambers that will tell the control system when to cut the beam, when the dose has been raised. Um, there exist now very sophisticated uh, um, electron linux. I mean, uh, some of them, for instance, are mounted on a robotic arm that can be rotated around the patient. So these are typically a few MeV electrons, of course. So they can be actually um, uh, aimed by 
by um, you know a computer to the patient, for instance, to deliver micro beams to treat brain metastasis. So these are typically system MV linear, so six MV energy are sufficient uh, because you need uh, to treat the small volumes, um, and you can reach uh, relatively high dose rates, so four gray per minute. Uh, at uh, at the treatment distance, so this is a typical. Um, you also have the um, <clears throat> the um, link to the uh, to the commercial uh, vendor of these machines. Another interesting uh, use of Linux uh, for therapy is what is called intraoperative radiation therapy, IRT. These photos I taken myself in the surgery room of uh, one of the major tumor history in Milano, the European Institute for Oncology. So they have uh, actually a small electron linear. Here the energy can be adjusted between 6 and 12 MeV. Treatment are given with electrons in this case because it is given during surgery. So after, for it is typically used for um, uh, breast cancer. So once the surgeon has removed the cancer, before, say, uh, you know, suing the patient, you know, closing the, the wound, they bring the machine into the treatment room and they point the beam to the uh, to the um, uh, area where the tumors were removed, and they give a single shot in radiation, could be 10, 20 gray, just to sterilize the area. And the big advantage of this is that you give in one shot the dose that you would give otherwise with the external radiation therapy to the patient a couple of weeks after surgery over maybe four or six weeks. So this will actually spare the patient to come back to the hospital for four to six weeks to get everyday radiation therapy. So whenever this can be done, it is done because, well, first of all, you don't irradiate anything else than the tumor because, I mean, you have no skin uh, to go through because the, 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 the patient is open where the tumor was. Um, electrons are very limited penetration, so you don't give any exit dose to the patient. The patient does not realize it because they're actually sleeping. And then you avoid the patient to come back for several weeks to get external radiation therapy. Now, modern treatment planning system can reach a very high um, dose uh, conformation. So at the end of this lecture, you know, I will talk about uh, proton therapy and carbon therapy, which are the state-of-the-art um, radiation therapy equipment, which are also very, very expensive and very, very complex with respect to, you know, uh, and uh, an electron linear. So in fact, those techniques are used for selected classes of tumors that cannot be treated successfully with what I call conventional radiation therapy. And in fact, conventional radiation therapy, so radiation therapy with photon beams uh, uh, produced by Linux can reach very, very sophisticated uh, treatment by using, for instance, like in this case, nine different direction of irradiation to reach the a good conformation of the dose. This is called intensity modulated radiation therapy. So what you do, you adjust the, the Linux parameter so that you treat the tumor from nine different directions, either during the same session or in different session. For instance, you can go one day, you can give the three, the, day, the following day you give these other three, the third day you, go, you, you give these three direction and then you start again. So this is a, uh, a color map of the deposited dose. And of course, the color tells you, you know, the, you know the, the, uh, the, the, the red is the maximum dose and uh, the, 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 the white or the pale uh, color here is the minimum dose. So this would allow to maximize the dose at the tumor. At the same time, keeping the dose to all the other surrounding tissues be below the um, the uh, the dose that would be complications. Now there is always a trade-off in the radiation therapy. If you give, for instance, the same dose to the tumor by a single field or by only two or three fields, of course you have a higher dose align the direction of irradiation, and you have zero dose outside. If you use multiple fields, like in this case you lower the dose from any direction, but you increase the total volume irradiated. So there is always a trade-off, there's always a balance. So the, uh, the uh, radio-oncologist, with the help of the medical physicist and of the treatment planning system, has to select the best 
combination of, uh, treat, of you know, the different beams to reach the optimum treatment plan. But as I said, as you can see here, with what I call conversion radiation therapy, you have, uh, you can reach a very sophisticated treatment plan. Now, the state of the art, you know, the ultimate, uh, you know, the, 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 the technology which has reached the, uh, you know, the top level is the, what is called the tomotherapy. This is actually, um, I mean, outside looks like a CT scanner, but in fact, inside you don't have an X-ray source for imaging. You have a 6 MeV electron liner, which is actually integrated with the CT scanner, in fact. So what you do while you irradiate the tumor, you also do imaging. It is called um, uh, Combeam CT. It is not the ideal image quality because for ideal image quality you use typically three 400 kv uh, kv x-rays you know in a CT scanner here you use uh, the 6 mev so i mean the image quality is not the same but it comes for free because the beam uh, traverses the patient uh, crosses the tumor and you get an image on the other side so the um you have a, a multi-leaf collimator, the one that I show you integrated into the LINAC. This system rotates like in a gantry, so you do, you do not have the, the entire structure rotated around the patient. You have the LINAC, which rotates inside the, the sort of scanner, like, uh, like, like in a scanner, the X-ray generator is rotated around, around the patient with the, you know, with, with the 180 degrees uh, opposite side of the, the imager. The couch slides in continuously while the machine rotates. And what you do, in fact, sorry, what you do, in fact, the treatment planning uh, adjusts the, the positioning of the multi leaf collimator according to where the beam is coming from. And it also adjusts the intensity of the beam so that as it reduces the intensity, the beam is coming in, um, traversing a, a you know, a, a, a volume and a, a tissues that are, that are more radio sensitive, so they're more prone to radiation damage, and increases the intensity when the beam goes across uh, um, healthy tissue, which is which are more radio resistant. So this is a very sophisticated um, way of treatment, which is um, which is uh, now used routinely in many hospitals. The other state of the art, which is now been entering the market and the and the hospital environment is the hybrid MRI linear. So instead of um, having an image guided with um, with the convincing CT that I showed before with the with the with the beam itself, you have the linear integrated into a magnetic resonance system. In order to have um, an image, an online image of the tumor with MRI, which does not give you any radiation, um, while you uh, treat the patient with uh, a 6 MeV uh, accelerator. So the accelerator and the MRI system operate simultaneously and independently. You can imagine the challenge because uh, an electron beam of 6 MeV, if you put in a magnetic field, well, it will not go straight as it would do if there is no magnetic field around. And the MRI have a three Tesla magnet, so they are pretty. Uh, so that this this is not just integrating a linear with an MRI. It's it's an integrated design, because the design of the linear has to be taken into account that if you if you have an electron beam moving and magnetic field will not go, it will not follow the same trajectory, if that would would be the case if there is no magnetic field. So um, this is the um, uh, and, and a small. Uh, uh, movie of what's actually happening uh, while you rotate the gantry while modulating the beam. So this is the field of view from the beam. So you do not, you're not actually rotating the patient behind, you see the image, you're actually rotating the machine around the patient. And the treatment planning tells you how to adjust the position of, of the multi-leaf collimator while the beam is shooting from that specific direction. So you have the LENAC going around the patient, the multi-leaf adjusting the shape of the lift according to the profile of the tumor from that direction, following what has been designed into the treatment planning system. 
So you've seen that with uh, uh, photon radiation therapy, you can reach quite now um, sophisticated treatment planning and you know dose delivery. As I said, there are specific classes of tumor which would benefit from an even, even more sophisticated treatment, which is particle therapy or radon therapy. And the reason is that the mechanism by which photons or hadrons interact with matter is not the same. So when you treat with um, a collimated photon beam produced by um, electron bremsstrahlung on a tungsten target, even if you collimate it, you will always have some penumbra, so you have some zone, some volumes around the, the main beam which get some scatter radiation, and you always get some dose before the tumor and after the tumor, because as I explained um, uh, last, last, last week, huh, when discussing uh, you know, uh, radiation dosimetry, the way photons or charged particles in the interactive matter is different. Photons are actually attenuated, they follow an exponential law. So you have a, a reduction in the intensity of the beam, of the, the photon beam while traversing uh, biological tissue, any matter, in fact, but that's all biological tissue here. Yeah? So you have a reduction of the intensity, but you always have some surviving photons crossing the tumor and irradiating the patient after the tumor. Um, whereas protons are charged particles, they interact in matter by ionizing, mostly by ionization of the um, atoms of the matter. So they lose energy, in fact, and at a certain point they stop. Not only they stop, but as we've seen in the next slide, they stop in a very, very useful manner for, uh, for using particle therapy. So we call it adron therapy because we are using actually the, some nucleus of uh, the, 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 the atom, which is actually made of uh, uh, nucleons, and the nucleons are either protons or carbon, which are hadrons. Hadrons are the fundamental um, bricks of matter which are made of quarks. So the electron, as far as we know, is, uh, is, the, is the elementary um, particle in the atomic uh, electronic structure, the fundamental uh, quantity, as far as we know, are the, the quarks, and three quarks made up either a proton or a neutron, depending on the mix up. And the hadron is either a proton or a neutron, or a mixture of them. So uh, in particle therapy or hadron therapy, at the moment, although there have been different types of particle testing, we use protons or carbon ions. And as I anticipated, the reason is this one. So if you take an eight, if you take um, an eight MeV photon, so a photon will be generated by a photon beam generated by, uh, you know, uh, you know, ten MeV electrolinac, and if you plot its attenuation through matter, so this is the, the relative dose across the the depth in the human body. So this is the skin, and this is the penetration depth. So the attenuation is exponential. That means if you have a tumor here, the cancer is here. Well, you will always, always have more dose between the skin and the tumor and some residual dose behind, excellent the patient. Um, when in the beginning they were using um, um, CZ137 photons, the uh, attenuation was such that the, most of the dose were given to the skin. Now, an MV photon will start here and will, I don't know why the plot is incomplete, will beat up like this. So you will have the maximum of the dose at around one centimeter, as you see there, and then they build up. So you will still spare the skin, but will, you will not spare, spare the uh, healthy tissue before the tumor, after the tumor. So this is why you have to actually use multiple directions of irradiation. Um, a 20 MV electron will have a penetration in matter that follow this path. So you would indeed, be able to treat the tumor, which is relatively superficial because they will never reach 20 centimeters. So electrons are still used for some uh, head and neck tumors, for some uh, superficial tumors. But the electrons scatter a lot in matter, so you will have a big tail past the tumor and you will have a lot of size scattering. Now, if you take a, a proton beam, the nice thing, as I said, that the proton, while penetrating matter, they slow down. So they slow down, 
by um, essentially losing energy and deposited energy throughout the tissue more or less at a constant rate until they are very slow, until they reach the end of their range. And in the last couple of centimeters, they deposit most of, uh, of their energy because the, uh, the energy deposit increases while, while the, the velocity of the proton decreases. So in fact, the nice thing here you see by yourself is that in fact, the most of the dose is deposited at the end of the range in the Bragg peak. So if you are a radiated tumor, which sits at this depth from, from this side, you have uh, from the skin to the tumor, way less dose that the tumor itself, first advantage. And second advantage, the Bragg peak is pretty sharp. So they essentially have no dose after the Bragg peak. So if you have, for instance, the spinal cord here, and you have a tumor which is just before the spinal cord, and the spinal cord is very radiosensitive, if you come from this direction, you hit the tumor, you don't touch the spinal cord. Now, in practice, the uh, situation is not ideal like this because the Bragg peak is pretty narrow. Is much narrower than any tumor in extension. So unless the tumor is very, very small, normally the tumor extends in depth by several centimeters. So in order to irradiate the entire tumor, you have to superimpose several Bragg peaks so that to achieve a dose which is like this. So you need a flat dose covering the entire tumor in depth, but uh, you pay for this by piling up these uh, plateau regions so that in fact the ratio between Bragg peak and plateau is not as good as in a single proton beam, but it's still better than this shape here and you still benefit from the sharp fall of the, of the Bragg peak. And so you can actually compare treatment planning system, sophisticated treatment planning system with the intensity modulated radiation therapy with photons with seven fields. Again, you have the um, relative dose, red is the tumor dose and blue is the, uh, is the, is the less dose. So you have seven fields to make up this uh, distribution and you have the, a similar treatment planning field with protons with only two fields. Having only two fields rather than seven would actually make the radiation faster. So it's going to benefit for the patient. And you also see that the dose distribution is even better. So you actually reach a better dose distribution. Um, or if you prefer, you spare the healthy tissue much more with two fit proton fields than with seven photon fields. The price you pay is that the machine is much more expensive. So, um, image guidance is necessary for ion beam therapy because, uh, of course, since the protons uh, are so precise, because also the lateral penumbra is uh, much more reduced with, than with photons, well, you have to be precise. So there is no point to have a, a tool that would uh, allow to aim at the tumor with one millimeter accuracy if your treatment planning system has a one centimeter uncertainty. So you have to have everything set up to exploit at best um, the, 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 the accuracy with which you can aim the beam. It's like when you have you know, an, a sound system, you can have a beautiful uh, you know, um, uh, loudspeaker, very expensive, but if you amplify it, it's bad, but you don't get a good sound. Right? So it's, it's, it's the same thing. You, know, you need the, the entire chain of tools um, uh, to be state of the art. So in fact, you deliver a narrow, a narrow um, proton beam, which put it a spot. And what you do then, you can scan across the volume because the beam is a, is, a, is a charged particle beam. So you can actually use magnet to scan across the volume. So you can actually scan across the tumor volume in depth by spot, by completely avoiding to dose what is behind the tumor and reducing the dose on this side uh, to the minimum because you expose the blood peak and again, no dose around. And this is the patient statistic so far. This is taken for the Proton Therapy Cooperative Group website that you access there. Um, so most of the um, uh, particle therapy is still using protons, but there are more and more facilities using carbon ions, which would, uh, you need uh, 400 MeV per nucleon carbon ions to reach the same penetration depth at 200 MeV protons. So you need the 4,800 MeV carbon ions versus Proton because a carbon ion brings six uh, charges, so the ionization, ionization capability is, 
is, is, uh, is much increased, but it also has a better biological effectiveness. So the machines that are used are two types, are either cyclotrons or um, synchrotrons. And if you see from the photo here of the IBA cyclotron, if you remember the photo of a, of a, of a cyclotron for adenocarp production, this is much bigger because for adenocarp production, you need typically between 10 and 18 MeV, you need 200 and 230 MeV. There is this one is the IBA one, there are a few commercial. This is a superconductive one by Axel Varian. Uh, this is a synchrotron by Itachi. And this is the Loma Linda synchrotron built by Fermilab. And it is the first hospital based proton accelerator installed in Loma Linda near Los Angeles in California. So this is the uh, Loma Linda proton accelerator. So let's have a quick look at, at the operating principle of a synchrotron. They're all, they're all the same, whether it's a Loma Linda one or the Itachi or whatever. A synchrotron, as you see, it's a ring of magnets. So, so it is no longer a big magnet like a cyclotron. Remember, B rho, what we discussed Tuesday. If you want to increase the energy of your particle, you either increase the magnetic field and you have limits, or you increase the bending radius. So you increase the machine size. But to make a cyclotron this big for 200 MeV, well, you see it, huh? it's this, it's big. So it is sometimes most cost effective to build not a solid magnet like this there. At up to 200 MeV, the two technologies are competitive. If you want to, want to build a 10 GV proton accelerator, you have no choice. You cannot build a 10 GV cyclotron because it would be enormous and the cost and the weight of the magnet will be enormous. So then you will have to use synchrotron technology. I mean, at CERN, we do not have, uh, you know, 7 TV cyclotron. You know, they're all synchrotron. But for this machine, you have other technology available. So the cyclotron, I'm not gonna explain it because you've seen it on Tuesday, so it's the same principle, except that it's bigger and gets to high energy. A cyclotron is the abandoned that is much lighter because you have a vacuum chamber, a donut-shaped vacuum chamber, which is installed inside a ring of magnets to guide the trajectory on a stable orbit. So since you want to keep since you cannot vary, like in a uh, cyclotron, the orbit, you cannot have the particle starting from here and it's paralyzing as you do in a cyclotron. They have to be in a, in a fixed orbit. They have to move inside this vacuum chamber. That means that the magnetic field has to vary together with the frequency of the accelerating system in order to that the uh, RF frequency and the magnetic field changes with the energy of the beam. So the machine is a bit more complicated. The other thing you can see from this picture, you cannot start from zero energy. You have to inject the beam, pre-accelerated into a LENAC, typically up to a few MeV, into the ring. So you, can, you, you, you do not have an ion source, you have an accelerator in place of an ion source, which has its own ion source. So you have an ion source, a LENAC that accelerates the beam. Uh, for instance, I think in the Loma Linda one is uh, two and a half MeV, in the Itachi one is seven MeV, but uh, I mean, it's a few MeV, and then you inject, you accelerate it, then you extract it, and you bring it toward the treatment. The principle is the same. So this is the same slide that you find early in this presentation, which tells you the equilibrium of the two forces, the one that, are, you know, the, the, the centripetal force that would uh, have the particle escaping from the orbit, and the magnetic field that would pull the particle toward the center. The two are in equilibrium. If, it, if the magnetic field is properly tuned, to the, to the velocity of the particle, so that the particle will move on a circular path, which in case of a synchrotron, it is really a fixed one, is a, is a fixed orbit um, uh, inside this uh, vacuum chamber. Now, uh, again, like in a cyclotron, this is the idea. In, in practice, like in a cyclotron, you don't have one particle. You have a, a beam of particles, and the beam of particles, it's made of billions of particles. For instance, the um, the um, beam current that you need to deliver the, the famous two gray per minute to a tumor is for a, for a proton beam is of the order of a nanoampere. A nanoampere, if you calculate, uh, you take from the, the elementary charge, is uh, um, something like a few 10 to the nine um, protons per second, which is a, a few billions of protons per second. So if you dream to inject for instance, in the magnet, one billion proton per second, and you hope that they will all go through along the reference orbit, well, it doesn't work. So if you don't, if you don't do nothing, 
the particles are injected into the ring with all sorts of um, direction and they will, most of them will actually be lost. So some of them will be actually captured by the magnetic field it will circulate on the closed orbit, but many other will be on a, on a different orbit and, will, and they will be lost because if they do not experience the correct field, they will be lost. So what you need, typically, you have uh, dipoles to keep the um, particles on a closed orbit, but then you need lenses. You need uh, is another type of magnet, which is called a quadrupole, as, as the name says, well, as a dipole, is a two poles, a quadrupole is four poles. And the poles are arranged in this configuration, the north <clears throat> and south opposite. And they act like, like lenses in optics. So what they do, a focusing quadrupole or a focusing lens, what it does, it will do nothing on a particle that we, that is actually traveling on the on the. Um, so this is the horizontal plane. Right? So look, you look the beam from the top. Huh? Look the beam at the top. The beam is actually so your reference particle, the particle that bears perfectly, will actually move along the trajectory in the horizontal plane. But the particle is actually escaping from it while it crosses one of these lenses, which is actually a magnet. Will experience a force that will pull it back into the middle. Now. If you do nothing, well, uh, then it will just uh, fly away on the other direction. But then you have another quadruple that will focus it back. So what you do, you have uh, lenses that would focus the beam back always in the middle plane. Now the point is that you have you have uh, two transverse directions. You have a horizontal one and you have vertical one. So now you're looking at the beam in the vertical plane. So like in lenses, a quadruple that focuses in one plane will defocus in the other plane. So what do you do? You couple two, which are rotated by 90 degrees. So that a quadruple, like in a, in a pair of uh, focusing and defocusing lens, if you take the horizontal plane, the quadruples are spaced in a way that the one that focuses in this plane, well, is sent back the particle into the media plane to do the reference trajectory, and that will cross the defocus, the plane with defocuses in that plane, uh, essentially uh, very close to the uh, reference orbit. So they will experience a very small force because the, the, the largest is the distance of the particle from the reference orbit, the strongest is the focusing force. So there will be little defocus and they will again focus in the, in, by, by the next quadruple. And the opposite happens in, in the other plane. So that in practice, you put the two things together, the particle, will keep swinging around the reference orbit and will still be contained in the vacuum chamber. So it's just like having a, a you know, a, a ball that you roll along a gutter. So if the ball is exact in the middle, it will go straight. But if you take a bunch of balls and you roll them through this gutter, well, one maybe will go straight, but the other will just oscillate around, around the gutter. So the gutter represents, if you like, the focusing force of the quadruple. So you have essentially a quadruple that will actually focus the beam, the particle in both directions, and will keep them confined into the vacuum chamber. So the beam will actually fill an envelope, which is defined by a beta function, we're not going to discuss here. But in fact, the, the combination of focusing and defocusing quadruples in both planes will give rise to a steady beam that circulates within the cycle, the, 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 the cycle. So, the, so the dipole will bend the beam and the quadruple will keep it focused. Perfect. So now you have a synchrotron, you excite the beam, the beam stays nicely focused in the vacuum chamber, you extract the beam, and now what do you do? Now, we've seen with um, um, Electron Linux, the Linux is a small machine, so it is actually mounted inside the structure that rotates around the patient. Here you cannot rotate the synchrotron around the patient. Well, then maybe you can, but I mean, it's way too complicated. I mean, you know, the, the, the components are aligned to the you know, the fractional millimeter. So what you do, you take the beam outside the synchrotron and you send it into a gantry. A gantry is a very heavy mechanical structure which is made by a beam line that will actually point the beam toward the isocenter. So what the patient would see is just this thing. So this is just part of the treatment room. <clears throat> the couch will simply slide into this uh, small uh, irradiation cave. This is the nozzle from which when the beam comes out, but the point is you, what you don't see that behind you have a synchrotron, you have a transport line, the beam goes bent by this uh, uh, 270 degree bend structure, which is mounted on a mechanical structure with a counterweight, because all this has to be rotated to, as I said before, to the millimeter precision. 
So this thing weighs something like 200 tons. So what it looks like to the patient is a conventional radiation therapy room. What is behind is much bigger. So typically you don't have one single treatment room because the cost of this equipment is such that um, it's worth to having one accelerator. This for instance, the ProScan at the um, um, Paul Shannon Institute in, in Villager, close to Zurich in Switzerland. You have one, they have an axial bearing cyclotron and they have various beam lines and they have four, well, three, if you like, therapy rooms. One with a fixed beam line to treat eye tumors and actually two equipped with gantries that would treat the patient from any direction. This is the very first design of the gantry they had. They have a second one here. And the other advantage is that because you need a very precise patient setup, the actual treatment time is a very small, typically one or two minutes, with respect to the overall time it takes to set up a patient for radiation. So you only take 20 minutes to uh, put the patient in the radiation uh, position, align the couch, the, place the, the, the gantry direction, uh, take the X-ray shots to make sure that you know the tumor is at the center. So maybe this takes 20 minutes, and then you, you have the beam for two minutes. <clears throat> so if you have only one treatment room, this is very inefficient because you may treat maybe two patients per hour. If you have three or four treatment rooms, well, when you treat the patient in one room, you set up the patient in the other two rooms, so the, you have a better uh, patient care. Now, these we saw, for those who were there um, last week, when we discussed um, the radio biology effects of radiation. So, so far we've talked about proton therapy. Now, protons have this beautiful dosimetric advantage, so they are much more accurate in irradiating a tumor, but they are radio biological which are affected, and so the damage they do to the tumor is about the same of the X-rays or the photons, or the photon you're excited in electron linear. It's 1.1, so it's 10% more effective, but it's not much. But if you remember what we discussed uh, last week, we had, we had particles like, for instance, carbon ions, where the I are B. So I repeat for the benefit did not follow the lecture last week, what is the RB? Take a, frac uh, a cell population. You have um, a cell population which live uh, life, you know, healthy until you give them radiation. So you, ir you irradiate them with a, with a certain dose <clears throat> and then you measure the survival fraction. So this is a, this is a radio biological experiment. We use the biological lab. So for instance, you have a certain dose from X-rays, um, they give 10% survival. Then you do the same thing with the carbon ions. And you see that to reach the same survival, you, you need less dose. You need a dose which is typically a factor of, factor of three less than X-rays. Means that carbon has a radiobiological effect is of three. So they're three times more efficient to kill cells than photons electrons and protons, because protons, the RB is 1.1. The RB is a very complex quantity. I'm not gonna discuss it here even because I'm not a radiobiologist, but if you can see from the curve, it, it depends on the, on the um, survival at which you do the measurement, you know, this distance and this distance is not the same. Um, the other thing that, 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 that this plot says is that, I mean, <clears throat> the uh, X-rays have a certain, uh, have a certain uh, capacity of uh, recuperate damage because of this peculiar shape of the curve, whereas the, there is no um, um, damage uh, recovery from, from carbon ions. But the whole point is that, I mean, the carbon ions are three times more efficient to kill tumors. So that means that you can actually give uh, um, less dose. So instead of giving, for instance, 60 grays like in um, photon therapy or 55 gray physical dose as in proton, you can just give 20 gray, which means that you can actually have the patient come in only one third of the time. So I mean, the treatment is more effective. But the other advantage is that the IRBE mean, um, makes them more efficient to treat selected times, uh, types of tumors. So they're actually better <clears throat> um, apt to kill tumor, for instance, which are uh, hypoxias, we have uh, less uh, flow of oxygen. So they are actually used to treat um, specific type of tumor. Now, if you look at the 
synchrotron to produce uh, protons, like here, or carbon ion. They look pretty much the same. No? This is a proton synchrotron from Hitachi. This is the ion synchrotron from Siemens. There is a tiny difference, the diameter. This is a seven meter machine, and this is a 20 meter machine. So yes, the design is similar, but this is much bigger. This is about 80 meters circumference machine. Because as I said, the uh, magnetic rigidity is not the same. So you have to accelerate protons to 200 MeV, 230 MeV. <clears throat> you have to accelerate carbon ions to 430 MeV per nucleon or 5 GeV. So the magnetic rigidity is, is much bigger. It's a factor three larger for carbon ions than protons. So if you cannot increase the magnetic field, because you are already at the maximum, if you're using you know, conventional magnets, maybe 1.8 uh, Tesla field, well, uh, remember the B-row, if you need to multiply by three the final energy, you need to multiply by three the radius, so the machine is much bigger. So a machine for ion therapy is much bigger um, than a machine for, for, um, for proton therapy, which would also make the design of a gantry way more complicated. So there is only one proton, uh, two proton um, uh, ion gantry uh, so far. There's one installed at Heidelberg, which is 600 tons of uh, piece of equipment, and one superconducting at, um, in Japan, near Tokyo, which is at 350 tons. So Knau, for instance, the National Center for Oncological Adon Therapy in Milan, this is a uh, cutaway view of the, uh, of the accelerator. So the single donor is bigger. So you still need Linux, which are installed inside the ring to pre-accelerate the proton or ion, they are injected into the ring, which is 80 meters in conference, it's 20 meter <clears throat> diameter. They are extracted and they're sent to three treatment rooms, two equipped with the horizontal beam and one equipped with one horizontal and one uh, vertical beam. They, uh, when they install canal, I mean, to install a gantry was to, well, there's no commercial design of an ion gantry. So Heidelberg had his own design. Uh, Ib, uh, Chiba, I mean, in the National Institute of Biological Science in Japan is his own design. Um, Knau is now thinking of uh, designing a gantry, but the shortcoming with carbon ion for the time being is that you only have fixed beam available except in very rare cases. This is the photo just of, uh, of the synchrotron, which is pretty, I mean, you see, it's a much more complex machine than the cyclotron, right? But for carbon ion, well, there is a one design of a carbon ion cyclotron, but the center which use carbon ion, they all have synchrotron. So these are the bending magnets, there are the 16 bending magnets. This is the radio frequency cavity, you have one, the machine, the, the particles come back uh, at each turn there, and you have uh, quadrupole magnets there. You have uh, um, the, the, the LINAC here, you have, uh, you have ion sources that would inject uh, um, the particle into so they, they transport it into the, the LINAC, which is then transported into the sink. So it's a very complicated piece of equipment. The treatment room like, looks like this. So for the patient, the patient doesn't see what is behind. I mean, so this is the treatment, the treatment room. You see how sophisticated is patient positioning system. You have a robotic arm that translates in the two directions, in the three direction, because you can also adjust the height. It is embedded, this is the vertical uh, beam. You have three uh, uh, X-rays to center the tumor in order to match the treatment plan with the dose that you have. The, um, there are now a few designs for a single room proton facility, not ion. So this is a very interesting one from uh, Medium Medical System. They actually designed a superconducting cyclotron, 10 Tesla, hyper compact, which is actually mounted on a gantry. So here is a single room machine, single room treatment facility because the the, the, the the accent is actually on the gantry. I've seen this one. I've done. The, I've been in uh, Ma uh, Maastricht uh, in, um, <clears throat> uh, in, the, uh, in the in the in, in Europe uh, to do some um, some uh, measurement there. So it's a very compact machine. The, again, the treatment room you see nothing. I mean, the patient just sees this thing here, and the machine rotates around the patient. Uh, so it's a very compact one. It is just a spot of this uh, the size of the cycle, right? If you compare this, it gives the 200 map that you get from the IBA one. Eh? So the superconducting technology is very effective. It's very, very compact. It's a disadvantage that you have to mount it on the gantry, so you have a, a, a only one treatment room. However, there is now some trend to go versus single room facilities. 
and the, 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 the advantages of a single room are the following. So um, if you have a, a, an expensive cytoton or synchrotron, you want more treatment rooms. And this is the footprint. So you see the, the size taken by the accelerator is minor with respect to everything else. So this is a large facility, which is expensive because each of these gantry costs as much as accelerator. A single room, either the Mavion uh, design, which actually is a, just a one room in which you have everything, or for instance, um, an alternative design, uh, which is proposed for instance by IBA, you have a, uh, the accelerator, the cycle in a separate room, but very close to the treatment room. Well, the advantage is actually much smaller, if you see the side, is uh, about one third or one fourth of a full size facility. So it is also less expensive. But the other advantage is that you can have, uh, instead of having a large hospital installed, for instance, in an African country, in one place with four treatment rooms, you could have four hospitals in four different places, maybe two, 300 kilometers apart. And the advantage is that the patient from any single site will not need to travel uh, um, to, to, to the, the, uni, the unique hospital who has this technology, we can go to the closest one. So again, this is expensive. This is still ex much more expensive than, than a medical lineup, but it is uh, maybe a factor of three less expensive than this, because remember the civil engineering costs as well. Eh? The land costs money, the, 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 the shipping instruction costs money, the machine co is the same, but one gantry costs uh, one fourth of four gantries. So there is some uh, advantage on that. Now let's now come to Africa, and that's the last bit in the last five minutes of my lecture. The problem is that Africa is not in the same condition as the rest of the world. So if you, if, you know, the typical requirement, uh, looking at the um, world cancer incidence, although there are distinctions from country to country, that ideally you would like to have, uh, like the green countries here, five or more radiation therapy equipment, say Linux, per million people, per million inhabitants. So looking at the cancer incidence, uh, knowing that, uh, you know, a lot of tumors will undergo, you know, a lot of uh, cancer patients will undergo radiation therapy either as the only um, treatment or more frequently as a combined treatment with surgery and or chemotherapy. If you want to be sure that you can treat all of the patients who need radiation therapy, you need at least five machines per million people. And you find it in Europe, you find it in North America, you find it in Australia, in Japan, um, in New Zealand, but not anywhere else. So here you have a country which has just suboptimal between three and five, so not that bad, but no, not ideal. And if you come to Africa, I mean, most of them, uh, most of the country have either no machines or uh, less than one. So there is a real problem here. <clears throat> so there are some, um, you can go and have a look at the, um, at these links, um, which are published available. There are, there are some initiatives. I presented this uh, two, two years ago at the, uh, the, uh, the previous Africa uh, School of Physics. There are some initiatives to try to develop uh, technologies for, you know, to expand in global access to radiotherapy. So there are some studies, you find them there. Um, <clears throat> so in fact, um, you know, the, the estimates of made by the International Agency for Research on Cancer is that there are about 15 million new cancer cases per year worldwide, and about two thirds actually occur in countries where, where there is less availability of radiation therapy equipment. And this number can only grow, can only grow with the growing um, worldwide population uh, with the um, um, aging of the population because in many countries, I mean, in most, most advanced countries, the population is actually aging. So the older you get, the more likely it is to get, uh, to get uh, cancer. And, um, um, and also, I mean, you know, lifestyle. And so this 15 year per year will certainly go up. And the um, age distribution of the same in fact there are significantly more cancer cases in childhood adolescents and young adults in Africa than in you know Italy probably which is also a problem because of course uh, <clears throat> the younger is the patient well the, it should be treated with state-of-the-art technologies to reduce to the maximum the likelihood to develop 
a secondary cancer because you know remember when you treat cancer you irradiate a very small volume with a very high dose you irradiate some healthy tissue with small doses and depend on the um, um, uh, volume the tumor size or the organs involved after a radiation therapy course you have uh, say a few percent um, increased cancer risk so you have a few percent risk of developing a secondary cancer in 10 years so if this happens with a person who is treated at the age of 70 or 20 well it's not the same thing eh? so clearly the fact that you have um, younger adult developing cancer would actually require more sophisticated radiation therapy equipment so the need is not only for uh, radiation therapy equipment but also for qualified profession profession as i mentioned before radiation oncologist radiation uh, physicist uh, radiotherapy technicians uh, radiation protection officers maintenance engineers and so on and medical infrastructure because as i said you need you know you need diagnostic equipment you need you know or you know transport you need, you need lots of things um, the challenges uh, for radiation therapy in Africa is that uh, the more okay, this is uh, this is data from um, 2016 to 2013, so there might have slightly changed, but not dramatic, I think. Um, so at the moment, you're only about half of the country, not even less than half, having teletherapy equipment. Um, there are some with um, brachytherapy resources, which is another um, um, technique for treating cancer, which I haven't discussed. Um, but you only have uh, less than 300 radiotherapy machines serving 1 billion individuals. Uh, you will need, uh, well, many more because you will need at least five per million, five or six. So you have one machine per 3.6 million people. So you will need the factor of three more, in fact. And then you also need human resources. There is a gap of uh, 7,500 oncologists, physicists, 1,000 physicists, 20,000 technicians, and so on and so forth. So there is a lack. Um, this is the RT resources which are estimated, I mean, the need estimated in the next 20 years. And in fact, the, both in terms of machines, um, professionals, so radiation oncologists, medical physicists, radiation technologists, you need more actually in the low to middle income countries than in developing countries. So you need more machines in the third world than in Europe. You need many more radiation oncologists then will be the need for, for developed countries, for high-income countries. You need more medical physicists, you need more radiation technologies. So this is certainly a need. So um, in terms of, for instance, of um, um, radiation therapy equipment, let's focus on LENA because as, as, as we saw, you know, the largest, large fraction of tumor can be well treated with, uh, you know, uh, modern LENAs. But the point is uh, sometimes, this, well, this you know, will need to operate maybe in difficult environments. You might have interruption in electricity and power supply that you should not have. You might have a uh, heat problem, you know, the linear needs to be cooled. And of course, if the external temperature is 20 degrees or 40 degrees, the cooling requirement are the same. Eh? You might, might have dust and humidity that we do not have maybe, you know, in the modern hospital in Milan. Um, you know, uh, accelerator need uh, maintenance, huh? they, they need uh, scheduled maintenance or sometimes uh, unscheduled maintenance. So the machine should be designed to be highly modular so the faulty part can easily be replaced by stuff on the side without the need of intervention you know, of, of, the, of the vendor. Uh, you need self-diagnosis in the machine. If you don't have enough trained personnel, at least you should have a machine that is capable of telling the personnel well, there's something wrong. So you have to stop uh, operation and check it. No? And also power consumption is an issue. Then in terms of screening, of course, uh, the early you diagnose a cancer, the more effective is radiation therapy. So you, one also need to improve screening and early diagnosis technique. Um, and then, as I said, you need, uh, you know, qualified professional, you need, uh, this profession has to be qualified and trained. You need a training program and medical infrastructure. So the challenges are a lot. There are some guidelines that you find in this um, um, document that you find online. So, I mean, you look uh, on internet and you find them um, and, 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 and that's it. I'd just like to conclude with just a list of uh, textbooks that you can uh, 
and you can look at. I mean, okay, I'm not sure these are all available online, but at least you have references. And uh, I will stop here because I think I've gone even past my time just to leave some time for questions. Christine, we can hear you. Yeah, you hear me? Yes, but not Christine. Ah, ah Christine, I activate the microphone, I think. It's okay now, no? Yes, now it's a, yes. Yeah. Exactly. We had a problem apparently from Eddie who couldn't hear. So hopefully this is uh, fixed now. So thanks yeah. for all this presentation, which completes as well very well what you presented last time. So we have, uh, uh, so, about the 20 students. So are there any questions from your side? No, there were just some questions. Uh, so, I don't know. Adayemo, did you manage to listen to the talk? Yes. Yeah, sir. I okay. had issues towards the last uh, end of it. Okay. No, yeah. mine should be okay because I'm saying I, I also have lots of problems with the new computer. So this is the old one, luckily, that is still working. Yeah, I know we can see you even as well. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so while you are thinking about different questions, I see that Laza is connected. So this is a good opportunity potentially yeah. to have him to discuss as well with uh, uh, all his uh, experience. And then we'll come to the, the question from uh, Sahel. So Laza, can you hear? Are you connected? Uh, yes, I can hear you guys. Very good. So now it's very nice to, to have you connected and you mentioned that one of your uh, your students is as well connected. So yes, yeah, we, uh, so I think uh, Rad is from Madagascar also is connected. So yeah, it's, it's very, very great talk. So I have a, I have a question uh, that, uh, that uh, I would like to have your thought about, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Salari. So what are your thoughts about the use of, uh, so there is the MR-LINAC that you explained using, uh, using the MRI and the LINAC yes. itself. Yes. But uh, before that, I think there is the cobalt, cobalt and the MRI. And since, since, the, since the MR issue that you mentioned about the, the problem in, in, in Africa, we don't have stable current, not electricity every day, wouldn't that be a good, uh, because that's still considered the cutting edge technology. Yeah, using the MR and the cobalt. So, what what, what, what are your thoughts? Well, the point is, you need um, somebody to design the machine because I mean, this is an integrated system, an integrated system with uh, um, the diagnostic tool, the magnetic resonance device, and the Linux. And the, the system is designed a way to allow what is called uh, image carrier radiation therapy but also intensely modulated. So the advantage of an accelerator is that it can actually modulate um, the intensity of the beam. With a cobalt 60, well, the problem with the cobalt 60, as you know, is that the uh, penetration is um, not that good. So you won't be able to reach um, a dose distribution similar to what you get from a Linux. You will still be able to properly design to you know, you could still integrate a multi-leaf collimator in a, in a cobalt 60 unit, of course. I don't know what type of collimator cobalt 60 units have now, but you know, those who were actually, now you don't uh, build cobalt 60 units anymore. I mean, you, you, I don't think you can actually buy one for radiation therapy. I'm, I'm not so sure, but um, the one that were designed in the past, they're probably still used. They typically have this, uh, you know, double jaw system, so you can shape your field uh, as a rectangle practically you can in principle i guess you could but you know the, the head design has to be modified integrate a multi-leaf which would at least allow to better shape the um direction uh, you know sort of the 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 the, um, the, um, the, 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 the conform the conformation of the field from the constituent profile the point is you will need somebody to take up the, the, the design of that, you, I don't think you can simply, you know, you cannot put a cobalt 60 or anything inside a, an MRI because, uh, because you know, the ball is too small. So you will really need a, you know, a dedicated design. And I'm not so sure who would be available to invest. Could be interesting to explore. I mean, but then the cost will be driven by the MRI more than a ball than a cobalt 60 unit. 
So I'm not so sure in terms of cost if you would really reduce a lot uh, the cost. Of course, the operational resource is easier than the Flagana Okay, yeah, thank you. I think uh, Diamo has a question. Uh, no, no, I'll try to. Uh, the problem about it is just that uh, clinically the cobalt is so, um, just like you know, the penetration is just about 0 0.5.6. And uh, using an MRI, really, you want to do more penetration, uh, more definition of volumes. And for other neck case scenarios, pelvises, for example, you can't escalate the doses with cobalt at all. It's, um, it's actually not going, and then we, even, in fact, in Africa, I think we've got major challenges that majority of the cobalt imported, like Nigeria, for example, is not um, being exported back. So we have problem of disposal. So it's not something that is being encouraged at all. Even for brachytherapy, we are always trying to just move on to irradium for treatment. As I mentioned before, you know, when you have a, a series of um, systems, the quality sits to the lower ring of the chain. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have a very sophisticated imaging system, but that is the dose delivery is, is bad. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that is one of the the main issues. Then you can you can actually with the cobalt you can do a lot of intensity modulation of the beam. It's just one point two five, unlike the six and the, that you can use for IMRT VMAT stores. You can actually do any modulations with that cobalt. It's not going to be that appropriate. So you can have MRI and they're not using the cobalt without being doing something fantastic. Um, um, I had this class with, uh, what was that? We managed it uh, some months ago. I mean, so I think it would be good to know the status of this initiative for designing, you know, uh, you know, robust Linux for um, difficult environment. As, we, as I was saying, you know, to, to, to have something which is robust, that is less prone to uh, Faults or you know parts which are usually exchangeable in case of a you know, of a of a problem. I don't know where, where we stand. Kristen, do you have any any information on that? Yeah, otherwise, we I could uh, go back to Manjit and ask um, if she has any any additional uh, information on, on the status of these projects. You mean about the design or what? Yeah, there's this initiative that started a couple of years ago to try to design a Linux which would be say easy to operate and to maintain in an African country where you know you might have a problem with electricity supply, dust, heat and there was an international initiative on that but I don't know where we stand. Yeah I think Varian came up with the initiative of Halcyon. I don't know if you know Halcyon through Varian and uh, Halcyon technology is just a 6 MV Linux Mm -hmm. the, uh, it's actually it's actually constructed to replace the cobalt because it's they want to dis, uh, they want to discourage people from the cobalt in Africa. Yeah. So Alcyon is actually to do that. But uh, two problems came into part. You know, one of the companies, like the variants I know, I'm always in contact with the guys there. Is that the company is not directly in Africa, especially in Nigeria, like you have in in Europe, in Germany, where these companies are. They have representatives. So the cost of that machine as a whole that was to solve the problem uh, like a mini one was also increased because you now have um, a representative so the cost is also very high in fact the halcyon is as you are buying a lena the price is just the same uh, it also comes with cbct port films and yeah. the price is the same so it's it's ridiculous i think one of the major challenges we have here is actually the price because the price here the minimum you could get for the Linux, even the major Linux, I think, is about one point three million dollars, and um, uh, the Alcyon as well could go as high as one point five or one point three even or two yeah. million. No, no, so, it's, a state, it's the state it's of the art machine. No? Exactly, it's the state of the art. So I don't know if we can have a model that will actually be easier, but that will actually be a new company or maybe a suggestion because I, the cost. It's one of the problems with investors back in Africa. They, if you can't get your money back in five years or six yeah. years. Well, no, ideally one would have to establish a factor in Africa, but of course, you know, yeah. there, I mean, it would be, it would be less expensive, I think. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's 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 pretty big, expensive. It's one of the challenges I think because the cost of the lineup is also high. Uh, secondly, I think we've got issues of the manpower at least because sometimes we get even some of the sophisticated Linux here. Uh, yeah. oh, get someone abroad. Mm. I'm that would be interesting. Uh, I could tell you in the last few years. When Go ahead, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. I thought we couldn't hear you. Go ahead, please, Adim. Yeah, there was some interruption. Is it breaking? Yeah, sometimes it's okay. breaking. Yeah. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? So the, the, we we have a manpower issue. Like in the last few years, I could tell you that we've just been able to do three-dimensional treatments, and we've not been able to do IMRT like you see in Europe, like the one you are showing now, uh, the v, and also VMAT as an example. Uh, those good techniques, at least, that will improve the quality of life of the patient. Yeah. It's it's actually absent. So that's another point that is the cost of billing act is one. The problem of the manpower is also one, and I think this, those are some of the challenges. Yeah. It, it could be interesting because it's related a bit to when we were in 2012 in Ghana, so there was as well this initiative with the GIA to try to support as well some compact accelerators, some compact uh, initiative for accelerator that would be supported as well by the INFN. I know that it was with uh, Luca Serafini, some kind of uh, potential startup that he was uh, discussing, and there was even a, a white uh, report uh, that was written with the JA, but not sure that it went further. Mm -hmm. So the other initiative that you speak about, so is maybe quite more recent and, and would be interesting to to check and follow up. Yeah, I, I know Ghana. Ghana, I think, have actually stepped up with the Ghana Swedish one. But you know, of course, when you take the population, like for Ghana, to, you, you, you need a million or at least a lina, but you could have like Nigeria has got 200 million, we've got nine linux, so the deficit is there. You, we've got very few centers to do this. So Ghana, I know they, they did, and of recent as well, I learned uh, Senegal actually has also done more. Um, Rwanda, I learned, is also coming up, but that's just like a center. Uh, Nigeria is also willing to come up with more centers, hopefully, if we can see some sort of assistance of investors, training, and stuff like that. But uh, hopefully, I think the will is there. Just how to go about it could be a problem sometimes, and uh, the financial aspect issues could also be. We have some questions on the chat, please. Yeah. So the first question, so which is uh, maybe outside of uh, today's scope. So this is uh, by uh, Sahed. So who were asking, so if you could uh, shed some more light uh, on fossil and uh, fission, fissionable uh, radionuclides. Uh, okay, we're not talking to an expert in uh, power reactor. For me, it's the same thing. So there are some, uh, as I mentioned last week, there are some uh, heavy nuclei, which are unstable by itself and, and um, uh, split easily in um, two or more uh, uh, frag, uh, you know, fragments, and this is a, which are e is easy to, to break with, uh, for instance, a neutron bombardment like, uh, like, uh, like in neutron reactors. Yeah. So these are the f uh, fish, fission of radionuclides, yes. It's the one that are on the top uh, up uh, end of the nuclei chart, in fact. Those were very heavy, and um, they, they, are, they are more prone to, to, to disintegrate, in fact. Um, whether a thermoneutron can be used to achieve nuclear fission, then I don't know, I would like to look at. Because in a power reactor, I think they use, uh, they use fast neutrons to induce fission. I'm not so sure if you have, um, um, uh, Nuclei who can actually be um, split by um, thermal. There, there are certainly nuclei which uh, um, have a high uh, cross section for cation and thermal neutrons. Um, I cannot tell you which one can be fissionable. In fact, in a nuclear reactor, they use fast, fast. In fact, they put the 
they put the uh, the fuel in in uh, in water to slow down the the reaction and it um, uh, well, I don't know exactly. I mean, I don't know what is the energy for. Uh, well, or maybe maybe they're actually efficient by by slow Newton as well. But I cannot tell you which one. I mean, it's not my field of work. So I could speak for the spallation, but uh, I guess it's uh, not that. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is spallation. I mean, it is you know. Uh, you have the hot neutron and then you go to your thermal neutron and you cool neutron as well. Okay, so then the next question is about uh, the, um, I mean, to compare the, the radiotherapy and the chemotherapy. So this is a question by Economy. Uh, this is talk to a doctor, <laughs> I'm a radiation oncologist. So for what I know, surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy are complementary tools. There are some tumors that respond well to, well, first of all, normally you, if you can intervene with surgery, you do it because you remove the tumor, as far as I know. There are some cases like, for instance, eye melanoma, which are well treated by protons, where the clear advantage is that you do not intervene. So you do not remove the eye because the alternative to proton therapy is to remove the eye. Proton therapy is not the only radiation therapy treatment for eye tumor there are also some you can also do implants around the the, the, the eye behind the bulb of uh, small radioactive um, um, sources to to deposit the, the dose locally um, so i say i'm not a medical doctor so i cannot tell when chemotherapy is used but uh, very often radiotherapy is used in conjunction with surgery to complement the, 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 the therapy sometime as a uh, treatment only because some tumors are first I think as far as I know head and neck are well treated by electrons so you do that and there are some tumors that respond well to chemotherapy I, uh, I think chemotherapy alone I may be wrong is not it's never a, a really a curative treatment it's always complemented to something else but again I'm not a doctor so I cannot really uh, tell you I mean. mm. So then there's uh, another question, so by Adam asking, so why the energy of motion is very important on, as a physical or on physical parameters? I'm not, I'm not fully sure I understand the question. The formula, I guess. Uh, so why do we need uh, a lot of uh, energy? I guess it's all the momentum. For proton, you mean? For protons? Adam? For protons, you need uh, energy that. So as I explained, you know, photons, they just have uh, uh, an exponential attenuation in tissue. So they will go through a, a volume of tissue that will be attenuated, but they will deposit uh, essentially um, energy across the, the, the path. Protons, they slow down. Protons, if you want to reach, uh, say, 10 centimeters in, in depth in tissue, you need about 100 mev. If you have 50 MEV, well, they stop before. So they don't do not read the depth. So, for instance, for, for uh, um, I mean, I said that, I mean, the typical energy you need from a cyclotron or a synchrotron for proton therapy is 230 MeV, with one exception. There are a few facilities dedicated to treatment of eye melanoma, eye tumor, for which you only need uh, 65, 70 MeV. Because the 70 MeV, if you, when you start from 70 MeV, you lose a few MeV while crossing all the ion chambers, a few uh, devices, and then you have enough energy to reach a depth in the, in the eye, which is about the maximum, I think, between two and three centimeters. So that's the only case in which a proton machine can be used for proton therapy for shallow tumors, typical eye. So with protons, you need uh, enough energy or velocity to go through the amount of uh, tissue uh, before reaching the tumor, if that was the question. Are you satisfied, Adam? Yeah, it's is clear, Santi. So what? It's clear, yeah, right. Yeah, this... Uh, the, the lines are going yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm that's clear. So, so, so thank you, Mr. So thank you, Dr. Kolsan. 
start with some others. Okay, so I think this is the, the answer that he was looking for. Very good. And then I just send you as well a link uh, because this is uh, the reference as well to those MOOC that we did, uh, where there is uh, so three different MOOC based on yeah for the use of uh, the um, the life science, but as well with introduction for the third MOOC on the radiotherapy. I mean not radiotherapy, but photon and then photon therapy and, and kind of complementary information that could be interesting in terms of how an accelerator works and more or less exactly what you had described. I think it was very well done in uh, only one hour, but if you want to further study and potentially have a certificate as well for this uh, Coursera. So without certificate, it's free. With a certificate, you have to pay a little bit, but then you can really learn in detail how uh, a, a particle accelerator works and how it could be applied as well for medical accelerator. So I think it's a good reference as well, isn't it, Marco? I will have a look as well. I had a look in the past, I will have a better look. Very good. So do we have any more questions? Uh, we're already 10 minutes. I think, I think it's quite late, so uh, we should wrap up. And uh, if people have more questions, they can... Took a bit longer than expected. No, 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 that's fine. They can contact you directly. Yeah. Uh, we have the recording of uh, the lectures and uh, also they are uh, the slides are available, and then you also give some materials at the end in terms of books. Uh, yeah. So then, uh, hopefully, uh, later on, we will uh, we will, we will ask everybody again for their interest uh, in any specific topic related related to medical applications, uh, and then we can come back to uh, Dr. Silari to see whether he will be willing and available to give more lectures. So, that was so very complete and interesting uh, lesson. So thanks a lot. Did you enjoy it? Good. Thank you. Okay then. Bye bye. Thank you, Marco. Thank you bye -bye. very much. Bye bye. Bye. We all hope that they're gonna be as well more Linux as well for medical application in Africa soon. And Laza, that was one of your dream as well. So hopefully you will make it to Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Ciao, ciao, bye bye. Right. Bye. Bye.